so two line chestnut board, generally about an inch long. You can see it's uh, white, it's got spines, uh, two spine tips on the abdomen. Um, generally the adults, they're long and slender. Uh, they have a very similar life cycle to bronze birch boar, if any of you are familiar with them. You've got that, it's a flat-headed boar, or yeah, flat-headed boar, meaning it's a D-shaped, it does a D-shaped exit hole. It generally attacks um, our oak trees, and it's particularly damaging after drought. Trying to characterize drought, 2012, really droughty year. Absolutely, absolutely. High temperatures, no precipitation. But looking at the weather pattern, especially in the Northeast Illinois, we get heavy, heavy wet springs. And then we get extended periods of no precipitation. Although this year, you know, we haven't necessarily seen that. Um, it could be compounding, but I think that most people um, really start talking about the, the, the beginning of decline with oaks in this region as, you know, right after that 2012 drought. We had a rough winter in 2014. We talked a lot about this. So Chris Bachtel was kind enough to show, uh, share this picture with me. This is a newly planted oak tree, all right? So again, crown dieback, you know, anything more than 30%, you start to see that shrubbiness, you see that bark peeling. Um, sometimes the uh, leaves can be brown during the growing season, but still remain on the tree. But I think it's a good idea not only to take a look at an older specimen, but to take a look at some of these younger specimens and, or you know, younger trees and really make sure that you're on top of any type of management plan. Trees at risk are bur oaks, red oaks, or white oaks. I mean, you know, these fully mature oaks, trees don't live forever, but uh, we certainly want to be able to help them if possible. Crown dieback, over on the right-hand side, you see where the red arrow is? See how you just got those, just those branches kind of coming up, almost like a stag horn, the horns of a stag. You know what? And that is the first sign for me, and we're, we are evaluating this professionally, that potentially that oak is being infected by two-line chestnut borer. First thing that I would do if I had the capability is to get trained tree crew up, looking at that tree, looking for exit holes, seeing if there's any bark peel back, seeing if there's any, any other decline that you can't see from the ground. And a lot of times you just, you can't, even with a pair of binoculars, you really can't, you know, do a good diagnosis as if you could, if you were able to get up and, and take a look at that tree. And who knows, maybe drones would be able to help us out at some point, cameras, but this is the beginning. This is the beginning. Um, been looking at this tree for probably five or six years and trying to figure out what was going on. You know, sadly, it is, I'll jump ahead. Sadly, um, right now, you know, most likely these trees are going to be, you know, slated either for a management plan, hopefully. I think Stephanie Adams is, Dr. Stephanie Adams, I should say, our new uh, tree pathologist at the Morton Arboretum is working on a potential treatment trial management plan. I know many of the tree care companies have management options for two-line chestnut borer. But I bring this up really truly to just kind of start banging on the drums like, hey, 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 guys, we really, guys and gals, we really need to be looking at those, the crown of these trees, especially, especially because we've got an, a native pest. And especially because if this tree is responding to, to soil compaction, it's res if it's responding to you know too much precipitation, any type of stress or strain on that, where it sends out that pheromone and that attractant to the two-line chestnut borer, it's important to, to be aware of it. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about uh, emerald ash borer because I'm not sure exactly who's in the audience and you know I'm hoping that there are 
our arborist from central and southern Illinois that this is a review for it's a review for all of us, but it's a heightened awareness. There's great research going on about biocontrol, uh, host resistant trees, uh, which is super exciting. So we sometimes think that EAB is you know one and done. Like it came through here, we're in the re removal and replanting uh, phase right now. But I think it's important to realize that this type of education is and research is continuing. So we know um, there's management. Oh, 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 you know what? Sorry about that. Uh, my slides must be a little bit mixed up. So this is this is two line chestnut borer. We're talking about uh, management. So active monitoring. You're seeing the the trees the photo over on the right hand side. You're noticing that decline. So you, you go back. You're starting to see the decline, the pictures taken from a different angle. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but starting to see how, you know, more and more of that crown is kind of shrinking down. Um, you know, natural controls, any parasitic wasps, very limited. Um, again, I mentioned, I know that there is preventative pesticide management in place for some of these high value trees. Uh, we will be exploring, the Morton Arboretum will be exploring some of those options. And I know many of you all, you know, from the tree care companies, you do have your own management for two-line chestnut borer. I think it was up in Wisconsin and Rainbow was talking about treatment. When you got burrow blight, you're also treating for two-line chestnut borer. So I'd like to see some really good research come of that uh, as well to see how effective it is. But uh, sorry, I got my slides a little mixed up. Emerald ash borer, we know it's a wood boring beetle. This is a bad one. Why is it? Because we overplanted our ash. We know that uh, we've learned from it, which is a, a, good, a good thing. It feeds almost exclusively on ash, to be honest with you. They have, I think, uh, Fraxinus ash is on the red list for the IUCN. Um, there isn't or there won't be enough wild seed populations for it to regenerate naturally. So uh, this is a pest of concern. We've learned about it. But agrilis, anything in the agrilis family is, is just uh, is, is a pest to be concerned about. Look right in the middle. You see in that blue, so emerald ash borers over there. We got some lookalikes. Look, two-line chestnut borer. Again, that's the one that keeps me up at night. Uh, you've got any number of beetles, that six-spotted tiger beetle on the uh, bottom right-hand corner. I saw that so much this spring, and I was amazed. People were stopping and asking if that was EAB. You know, it doesn't look like it necessarily, but again, people get that image in their head. You know, they think about that emerald color, and it is a beautiful emerald color, but just wanted to show you what some of these look like lookalikes potentially could be. Honestly, I don't think the green stick bud looks a lot like EAB or the Japanese beetle, but you know what, anything that has kind of that unique marking potentially could be misidentified. Our distribution, we see it the front just moving west. We know that. We've got a you know active population in Colorado as well. So you see this destruction, you know that the larva gets in. Again, you've got that D-shaped exit hole, that uh, flat-headed borer family. We know this, pictures were taken in Ohio, don't let this, I feel badly for Ohio, not only got emerald ash borer, but they're still working on an active population of uh, Asian longhorn beetle. Very similar, we see this life cycle again and again. Um, they populations are able to build when you have very close proximity of all of these ash trees that are available. And I shouldn't necessarily say close proximity because that's in urban areas. Uh, in rural areas, you know what, it's surprising that you're driving down the road and you see one big dead ash tree and you realize that, you know, they do travel and they do find their host. Signs that we see over time, I'm just trying to build awareness for those, those early signs, like getting out ahead of this. If any time you've got any type of crown dieback, you've got that main leader stem that's thinning out, definitely have a chance to take a look at it. Trees on the, on the right-hand side, you know, that tree's over the far right-hand side, that tree's on its way out. You see that the three together, kind of a progressive stage with the epicormic shoots, 
you know, that we know that tree is, is definitely dead. Next up, we've got that, what I call the game changer. I've been talking about it a lot, and I, I am concerned that um, we all kind of just get used to hearing about it and not looking for it. And I think that part of the challenge in my position is making these pests really remain relevant to all of us so that we can get an early detection because it is so very important. Um, pathway arrived in Pennsylvania in 2014. We know that it is spreading. It's spreading by rail cars. It's spreading by movement of material. Uh, Pennsylvania, the Department of Agriculture has done a phenomenal job in working with industry to put together training and certification process uh, and program in place. And if something were to, uh, if Spotted Lanternfly were to get established in Illinois, we would definitely be reaching out to all of you um, to, to kind of talk a little bit about what is the best way to train and, and, and make sure that people are aware of how to identify and how to report and how to manage uh, a pest like this. Again, the vectors hardscape came from China on stone material. And you know, it, the big concern in this with spotted lanternfly is it getting into the urban areas and not being detected. A lot of times we know that tree of heaven is the main buffer. It's between a highway, a railroad, uh, airport, you name it, it's a tough tree but it's also a tree that provides services. You know, it provides, you know, it cleans air. It provides, you know, stormwater uh, services. It, it, it is a tree. And even though it's in, invasive, um, people would say it's everywhere. It's everywhere that you don't want to manage. And so taking it down, you know, when you've got, uh, You've got a gas station, and then you've got a, a, like a junkyard. Who wants to see the junkyard? Certainly, you know, a lot of people don't, so that's why they keep it up for screening. They are doing a great job in trying to build awareness. They use social media. They've got all sorts of really good uh, videos out that are excellent. I don't think I have one. Um, in this presentation, but again, if you're looking for more information, I'd be happy to provide it for you. Uh, I think a couple of us have already seen this. Uh, the survey that was done by Kelly Estes, and she is the state survey coordinator for uh, the Illinois Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program. So looking at that, so what is the risk that it would get established? Well, we know the risk. I mean, the Tree of Heaven distribution over on the right-hand side, honestly, I haven't had a chance to update it since I presented, or since I shared it last week. Um, but there are more counties filling in, and I would imagine that the whole state would be lit up in green, um, you know, if we got people to report it. So we are monitoring the distribution. We're looking at pathways. We know this pathway. I think this might have come from Chris Evans. So looking at, you know, what is this? We've got a lot of miles of roads, railroad, airports, sawmills, marinas. I mean, we've got stone importers, you name it. Um, you know, we've got a lot of firewood too. Firewood, people camping, uh, camping everywhere, especially, you know, this year, it's gonna be a big year for camping, I would imagine. So that uh, conversation of not moving firewood is, is really important. Trains, planes, and automobiles. We know that this pest can uh, lay its eggs anywhere, anywhere it wants to. Uh, it can do it on a you know, rail car, a telephone pole, a wood pallet, a uh, rusty bridge, um, a, a gas grill. You know, it's kind of just a big generalist that doesn't need a lot of uh, host specificity. Why do we care? We care because remember I was talking about the year of international plant health. I mean, this pest really, truly, I mean, over on the right-hand side, you're looking at hops. In the middle, you're looking at grapes. Bottom, we've got our stone fruits. I mean, this, again, you know, is the same story that we've heard before. But now that we're focused on kind of plant health, 
and making sure that we've got food security is very important. And then we have industry. We have boutique vintners. We have agriculture. A lot of these um, you know, ag fields are lined, not necessarily with tree of heaven, but they do have that buffer zone around it. And like you've seen with many of our other you know, pest threats, our native boars, our native beetles, you know, they're not the ones that we worry about. Oftentimes they don't have to take down a tree. Um, they are our recyclers. They go after the dead and dying. Uh, certainly in our natural areas, you know, they're a great decomposer. But to have to take down Tree of Heaven because we got a pest infestation, it's, it's overwhelming. These were taken, uh, I can't remember which town. Um, these were taken, I think, I think over by Wheeling. Um, or Palos, maybe. Anyway, so what you're seeing here is our intern, Leslie, and this is just a, a, a parking, parking lot for cabs. So all these big U-Hauls come and they just put their cab there, they let it sit, whether or not it's gonna be overnight, two weeks a week, we don't know. Um, potentially, we've got material coming from the East Coast that could be sitting for a period of time. And what you're seeing right here is Tree of Heaven. So right next to a vehicle that potentially could unknowingly have moved an egg mass, it's right here. And on the other side, this is a storage facility. So planes, uh, not planes, you've got boats, you've got sea dews, you've got campers, everything is sitting out there. People travel, they come back, and there's no protocol to have it washed out. So there's no play, clean, go you know, information, which is, is sad to see. Um, but we definitely will go back and kind of meet with these folks and kind of talk a little bit about their role in that high risk pathway. Life cycle is very similar to gypsy moth. Egg masses, over on the left hand side, you're seeing this female, see that little yellow dot right in the center? She is full with egg masses. What she does is she lays them, they're on the white part, and then she goes over it again with this waxy coating, it takes about 30 minutes, so you can see, because we now know how long it takes her to lay these egg masses, and they can be multiple egg masses within a year, you can start to conceptualize how potentially these would move about. This is last year's. Obviously, it looks like sausages or tire tracks. You see the exit holes right in the center. Why Tree of Heaven? Um, to be honest with you, the research has kind of come out that it's not just Tree of Heaven. The fecundity increases, so the viability of all those eggs, those egg masses, those two or three hundred that could be in that little spot. You know, it could be that Tree of Heaven gives this spotted lanternfly, which isn't a fly at all. Oh my. Um, it's actually a leaf hopper. And so very different from emerald ash borer who disrupts that phloem. Asian longhorn beetle gets into the heartwood. This leafhopper, the spotted lanternfly, actually just is a heavy feeder. And so what we're thinking about right now is chlorosis. And so we're thinking about anything that's feeding on these trees and these shrubs that are, and, the, and, and grapevines as well that are going to be weakening them during the growing season, depleting the fluids within the petioles. You know, we need to, to think about, you know, when we see chlorosis, don't just see the yellow. Go out and try to figure out why is that plant, why is that tree chlorotic? Why is my walnut turning yellow right now? And, and it wasn't before in the past. I'm just going to nerd out right now and tell you that, that, Tree of Heaven, see those lenticels right in the center? So spotted lanternfly uses its piercing mouth part. And when that tree is just flowing with sap, it takes its piercing mouth part, opens that hole like a wound, and puts some saliva down or some fluid around, and it keeps that hole open. And it uses the turgor pressure on, to, to pull out all of that fluid. I mean, I know it's not cool, 
but it is interesting to think about what other types of trees are like that, you know, so that have those lenticels, those easily accessible uh, feeding tubes or feeding stations for this pest. Um, it, pardon me if you've already seen this, but I'll show you that this is video that I took and just over on the left hand side to show you how quickly they're moving. Oh, yeah. yeah, is it what, 20 times more? <laughs> That's why I don't have everywhere. I have at least 100 photos. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I have a lot. I just need more. That is the third instar. So, this one you're starting to see how it actually moves up the tree. It's got sticky pads. That's why they call it, that's a, it's a leaf hopper. Oh yeah, is it what, 20 times? So we're looking at impacts. These are our images that we've already seen and I will update this. Um, the, the ability for populations to build are significant based on the amount of, you know, eggs within an egg mass and the fact that, you know, they can have, you know, two or three, uh, life cycles, you know, two or three egg laying events. Uh, we all know if you're looking at some of these trees and there's black sooty mold, you know what, start taking a closer look and figuring out what's going on. Survey and management, uh, the monitoring that we're doing right now, looking at the distribution of Tree of Heaven will help us to develop a, a management, a survey, a plan I think it's going to be uh, very helpful and it's something that I would reach out to, to those of you that have access to tree inventories to help us pinpoint where those pockets are and then look at the industry around it and try to uh, prioritize survey and then ultimately look at management. Very similar to Gypsy Moth, um, you know, looking at using bug coat I believe is the preferred sticky band, seems to have the least amount of uh, bycatches or collateral damage on this. We need a whole lot more of these. <laughs> Praying mantis, everybody asks me kind of like, well, what keeps it in check in their native range? And a colleague of mine, Chai Shen Hua, uh, was in China, I believe earlier this year, I think it was like in January or February, and she saw spotted lanternfly and she was asking them, you know, why is this not a problem for you? And they said, well, they don't have that, that big aggregate population. They don't have this explosion like we seem to be having. And um, they said that praying mantis actually goes after spotted lanternfly. So I thought, ah, it's pretty cool. We just need a whole lot more of them right now. And we need to make sure they're in Pennsylvania. So what we're doing is, and I think you may have been aware of this, but I want to make sure that we're following up on uh, work that we're doing year over year. So in 2018, we had five reports of uh, Tree of Heaven. And if you're looking at it from a funding standpoint, and you're looking at trying to build a case for Illinois being a high risk state, if you've got five reports, and so, you know, it was in Southern Illinois, I think Kevin was the one that was reporting them, um, people will go, Probably not, you know, not a big issue. We don't see it visually. So we had a big effort, we've been a big awareness. Uh, Chris Evans has been super helpful in getting people trained up and, and reporting. We've been working with our tree keepers. We've been working with a community of trained volunteers. Um, we've been working with industry professionals. APHIS has been helping out as well. So you can see in 2019, we had over 500 reports and you're starting to see where these pockets are. So obviously up around Chicago and then in, in and around central Illinois and Springfield and then in St. Louis. Well, thus, just this far, just this past, so we're just this past year, we've been able to add over 150 points. And so now you're starting to see how widely distributed Tree of Heaven is. If we were to drill down on this map, it would just light up with just a bunch of red points. So we are, there it is, Tree of Heaven. If you've ever smelt it, you will never unsmell it. Uh, the females right now, all seeds are out, it's easy to do a detection. We even tried doing windshield IT. <laughs> I had to put that in because it was like, 
maybe if we just drove around, we could identify where they are. Uh, but it's better to get out and do some ground through things. So uh, we are ground through thing nine locations around uh, the seven county region. And that was based on the 2010 tree census data that was conducted. So I think it's important to kind of take a look at, you know, this tree census data and then also be able to look at the 2020 data once it's completed. We have seen it, this is Hinsdale, kind of a back corner, nobody's paying attention to it. You see wood pallets, you see concrete blocks, stones, everything, you know, bunch of debris left over. That population in 2010 has not been eradicated by 2020. That's a problem. So we need to work on that. Again, this is in Wheeling. And so there's Tree of Heaven over on the left-hand side. You can see Leslie. That point was there in 2010. And over on the other side of the fence is a stone importer, biggest high-risk pathway. Right now, you're looking at this picture. I took this because they couldn't figure out, like, they couldn't remove the Tree of Heaven in 2010. So what do they do? They asphalt it all the way up to the trunk. And then there was a telephone pole right up through the middle of it. And that tree is as happy as it could possibly be. And there's its buddy, Buckthorn. I see Tree of Heaven and Buckthorn everywhere. It's, it's, it's amazing. It really is how widely distributed it is. Uh, and there, that's just another shot of it. We're looking at adding new records. So when we do find them, we're finding them a lot around in Elgin in the area. Uh, we found them in Gray's Lake. I mean, it, we've gone to a, probably 10 south side of Chicago, Harvey, big population there. Typically, they are on a transition area, a buffer zone, either between rail or yard or a combination of. So transportation is going to be another uh, uh, industry that we'll be working with as well. EdsMap is super cool and easy. I'm not going to talk that much about it, but if you go to EdsMap Pro, you can use it. It's super easy to use, doesn't take a lot of data, user-friendly. Records are very helpful. If you are interested in helping document Tree of Heaven, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, you start out on your desktop with EdsMap, set up your user profile, and you can walk through and, and set up all your county maps if you want to, so that when you get into the field, points that have already been verified will pop up and you can see where they are. Uh, that's just another area. So what we're doing with, uh, in collaboration with uh, University of Georgia, Bugwood, is trying to round up these points and then color code them and come up with prioritization for monitoring. So this is what it looks like just really quickly. There you go. We've got the management of invasive plants and pests. If, I, if you're interested, if you want some, you know what, just shoot me an email. I'd be happy to mail them out to you. I'd be happy to drop them off and, and leave them uh, at a location that's agreed upon. Uh, this um, U of I box, I think Chris, Chris is put out there, I, I took this from Chris, thank you for Chris, uh, so that the management guide is online, so you don't have to, if you don't want a, a physical copy and you want to be able to review it, you can review it. A lot of good information about managing plants, as well as all of these tree pest threats, and then how to report it. If you see it, we want to know about it, lanternfly at illinois.edu, make sure you write that down. We do have scraper cards. If you are interested in getting a set of scraper cards, I would be happy to send them to you. Uh, just let me know. I think my email address is coming up. If not, I know that April has it as well. But we're really important. We're really interested in having people uh, report anything if they see something suspicious. Uh, first line of defense goes to Illinois Department of Agriculture, 815-787-5476. Um, here's another set of Scott Shermer from uh, Department of Ag, Greg, Greg Rensler from USDA APHIS, and here is my contact information. 